Well, we're going to jump into a discussion of magnetic methods now, and um, let's just jump right into some interpretation. And what we see over here to the right is this is an old field. It's in Wyoming. It's the Teapot Dome field, and the wells in this field have been drilled, uh, oh, beginning back in the early 1900s. Uh, so the wells that are in this field, their locations are well known, and what the magnetic survey that, that was done over here demonstrates, basically, is that um, uh, the magnetic field, uh, this is an airborne survey, can be used to identify the well locations in this area quite, uh, quite well. Now, if we come over here to the right and look at an area where, well, the wells may have been drilled in an earlier time, they, there's not really, perhaps, uh, the information on the location is not as reliable. Uh, you can see where the magnetic survey, this is, again, an airborne magnetic survey, uh, shows the locations of the wells more precisely than the locations that were spotted on the map. So the Magnetic surveys certainly uh, uh, helped uh, define and relocate the positions of these wells, and that would be something important to do if you were going to do um, some sort of enhanced uh, uh, oil recovery where you were going to be injecting things, where you were going to be fracking well, and uh, so on, and you didn't want to have frac fluids enter uh, another well that you might not have known was there. So making sure that you know where all the wells are is a good thing to do, and that's one of the things that you can do with magnetic, uh, with magnetic data. And now in the next slide, um, so we, we talked about uh, oh, an interpretation, and we showed that magnetic fields are you know, indeed useful. Now if we start thinking about what is the Earth's magnetic field, um, what are the contributions to the Earth's magnetic field? Uh, we have them listed over here on the right, and on, on the left you can see what we think of usually as the Earth's main magnetic field. And it, um, in terms of magnetic field intensity, it extends from about 2,500 nanoteslas to 65,000 nanoteslas, a little bit greater, a little bit less on this end, but basically over a range of about 40,000 nanoteslas, we'll talk about units. Uh, Later on, nanoteslas and gammas are effectively the same unit. And the comparison has often, you know, often been made that the uh, Earth's magnetic field is a lot like that of the dipole. In fact, uh, some people say that it, about 90% of the field can be explained as a simple dipole. Now, if we look at the dipole field up here, we can see the, the density of field lines in the polar regions, uh, the poles of the dipole are, you know, it's much, they're much uh, denser, the flux density is much larger than it is in the equatorial region. In fact, when we talk about the uh, field of a dipole, we'll find that uh, the field strength in the polar region is about twice that in the equatorial region. And you can kind of see that here in the magnetic field of the, uh, of the Earth. So in the polar regions, the Magnetic field intensity, about 65,000 in the equatorial region, um, uh, somewhere between uh, you know, 25,000 to 40,000. So not exactly a factor of two, but then the magnetic field of the Earth is not a simple dipole field either. So there are, uh, there are other components of the Earth's magnetic field that, that uh, uh, perturb it from that of a, of a simple dipole. So we have the Earth's main magnetic field, and when you're out there collecting a survey, if you were doing a regional survey, then you would expect to see these kinds of variations, which would really not, you know, when we talked about gra gravitational fields, they're the shape of the Earth influence, the change in gravity. Well, the, these variations in magnetic field intensity are not associated uh, with the geology of the Earth's uh, geology so much as with the magnetic field that's being generated in the Earth's liquid iron uh, outer core. Now the fields that you're probably most likely going to be interested in are going to be going to be going to fall into this category of remnant magnetic field. 
And if you're interested in basin exploration, understanding, locating where the faults are, uh, and so on, the magnetic fields that you see, the magnetic fields associated with displacement on uh, crustal materials in the basement, uh, are going to be the magnetic fields that formed when those rocks, as they as they formed, uh, as igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks, at, at the time that their temperatures dropped below the Curie temperature, they took on the magnetic field, the local magnetic field, uh, at that uh, location and point in time. And basically, that magnetic field was frozen in those rocks. And so that's a field which you're, you're, most of us are going to be looking at and trying to interpret, and most of our interest is going to be focused on. Now there are also fluctuations in the in the main field and in the fields that you're looking at when you're conducting a magnetic uh, survey that are associated with um, the the solar wind, which is uh, hurling um, gamma rays, uh, electrons, protons, charged particles at the uh, at the Earth. They're um, caught up in the Earth's magnetic field. And, they actually stir up currents in the Earth's ionosphere, which produces, which produce, and also in the crust, which produces a secondary field, uh, an induced uh, electromagnetic field, which uh, you will also see when you are um, collecting data. So we'll come back and we'll talk about that in a minute as, as well. Now, <coughs> the diagram that you see here at the left, this blue cage, is the defines the outer core boundary. It's almost perfectly spherical. And uh, now this zone in the interior of the outer core, this you know the outer core consists primarily of molten iron and nickel. And uh, you can see that there is a cylindrically shaped region in the outer core, which is referred to as a region of large zone of flow. And you can imagine that this region is shaped by the rotation of the Earth, which is counterclockwise when you're looking down on the North Pole. So it shouldn't be surprising that there are going to be these um, uh, kinds of cylindrical features that are ge generated as the um, uh, Earth's, uh, as the Earth's uh, core rotates. And um, this is getting um, into some details that maybe go a little bit beyond what we're interested in, but it it's been observed that the, and this is the inner core, so this is a solid iron inner core, and it's been observed that the inner core actually rotates a little bit more quickly than the Earth's uh, mantle. And uh, this uh, rotation in here is, the speed up is produced by the magnetic field which is generated in the liquid outer core. So the this, this same phenomena, the magnetic field in the liquid outer core, also leads to a uh, damping of the eastward rotation of the outer core. So it tends to drift to the west, and we'll see that later on. But now here's a model. Now these, these models come from Glatzmeyer and Roberts uh, at the University of Santa Cruz in California. And in this uh, field line diagram here, you can see the blue lines are field line vectors which point towards the north magnetic pole. And the golden or uh, yellow field lines that uh, they point upward into the Earth's uh, south magnetic pole. And you can see that the field lines are quite turbulent here uh, at other latitudes. And so when we looked at this feature here, for example, we can see that it may be due to some of this uh, turbulent flow within the, or maybe some of this uh, going on over here, within the, um, uh, within the outer, outer coil, outer core. So, uh, so good visualizations that kind of maybe give you some feeling for where the Earth's magnetic field is coming from. And, uh, now here would be the um, <coughs> crustal field. And, uh, you know, just as a reminder, it may be kind of hard to see, this is the Mid-Atlantic uh, Ridge, the Mid-Ocean Ridge here in the Atlantic Ocean. This is North America, this is uh, uh, Europe and Africa. 
and this is a spreading center so we have new crust that is coming out on either side at about two centimeters a year spreading away from the uh, crustal ridge and uh, uh, something else that we won't talk too much about that I'm sure you, you've heard about probably in an introductory geology course is that the uh, uh, the Earth's magnetic field reverses uh, you know the period of reversals uh, period between reversals varies from Few, few hundred thousand years or so, and uh, so when it uh, when it flips polarity, we get a flip in the polarity of the material that uh, forms at the ridge and solidifies. When it, you know again when it drops below the Curie temperature, it takes on the uh, orientation of the Earth's magnetic field at that uh, location and point in time. So we tend to see a striped. Um, striping in the magnetic field of the oceanic crust, which uh, uh, goes back and forth as the Earth's polarity changes back and forth. And this um, feature in the ocean floor, of course, led to the recognition of, uh, and the development of the theory of plate tectonics. Now, notice that the scale of the anomalies in the crustal materials is about 400 nanoteslas, uh, but just to go back a couple slides, this is about 40,000 nanoteslas. So uh, the anomalies that we see in the crust are about one hundredth uh, on average of the uh, variations in the anomalies that we see uh, that are produced by um, uh, currents in the uh, liquid, in the Earth's liquid outer, outer core. So this is a, a NOAA site here, and uh, this is another one I won't. I won't um, spend much time on it, but again, you can see the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you can see the striping that occurs, and uh, maybe you can find your location and uh, have some fun trying to um, uh, maybe locate some anomalies that you might f be familiar with or uh, give you uh, some feeling for what's going on in your part of the world, and this would be the website that you would want to uh, look at. A nice animation. Uh, it's worth spending a little bit of time uh, looking at it and thinking about it. Uh, this would be the Pacific Ocean Basin here, again, North America. So these would be anomalies in the deeper crust uh, covered by the sedimentary cover, and then we're back into the mid-ocean ridge here in the Atlantic. So you can probably find something of interest in your own area. Uh, we also mentioned, you know, as a third component, and there are more, but, but there are electric, uh, geoelectric currents which are generated in the Earth's uh, ionosphere, and here's a recording of the uh, electric fields in the X and Y direction. They tend to be predominantly in the X and Y direction, and over here we can, we can see that the uh, uh, field intensity will vary throughout the day associated with these geoelectric uh, currents, and uh, so this to, to a large extent, depends on what's happening on the sun and uh, what's happening with the solar weather. And here is, uh, this is an observation that's made about 6.6 .6 Earth radii from the center of the Earth on a geostationary orbit. The satellite is called uh, GOES. And you can see the fluctuations during the period of a day. Uh, the blue is um, on the western edge of the North American continent, and the red is on the eastern edge, and M is midnight and is noon. Uh, this is another diagram which is kind of helpful to look at. Uh, this is uh, uh, circa 2017, October 18th. Now, depending on what's going on on the sun, we talked about the... We, we, we talked about the solar quiet behavior uh, over a 10-minute period. You know, you may see fluctuations uh, uh, on the order of about 10 gammas. But during a typical solar storm, when you have solar flares that are hurled at the Earth, you'll see fluctuations on the order of, uh, at, at ground level, on the order of, uh, of 100 nanoteslas or so. <clears throat> So these would be uh, uh, fluctuations that would fall into that third category. And um, here's another 
because, of, well, this just kind of shows the relationships between sunspots and uh, solar flares. Usually when we have a lot of sunspot activity, we have a lot of solar flare activity. This was a prediction that was made back in about 2010, 20, 20, uh, 29, and uh, you can see that as we're coming up here towards 2017, that the prediction was pretty, pretty good. So um, anyway, sunspot, sunspot cycles come in 11-year cycles, and during these sunspot maxima, you have a lot of uh, solar flare activity and a lot of uh, micropulsations that uh, can uh, lead up to a kind of a bad day in the field, a noisy day. So next time we're going to talk about secular variations in the Earth's magnetic field, and I kind of run over time on this one, so I won't dwell on this, but uh, uh, secular variations would be the longer term type variations that we, that we uh, also see, uh, and we'll talk, about, talk more about that next time. So thanks for joining us. Uh, see you next time.